Joseph knew that God was with him. Even in the midst of the betrayal, even in slavery, when he was faced with this darkest season in his life, it was knowing the presence of his father that made all of the difference in the world. And whereas you see in chapter 38, a great failure on the part of Judah, you turn the page to chapter 39, and there is one word that is used three times to describe Joseph in this chapter. It's the word successful. Three different times in Genesis chapter 39, it says that Joseph was successful. Now the word in Hebrew, it means to prosper. It means to flourish. It, it has the, the imagery of a, of a plant that is uh, putting deep roots into the ground. And even though the harshness of the sun beats down, even though there are thorns and weeds that try to choke its life out, a, a plant that flourishes is a, a plant that grows in such a healthy way that it bears fruit. That's the word used to describe Joseph in the midst of the circumstances of Genesis chapter 39. He was a man who despite all of the wrong that had been done to him, despite all of the uh, suffering that he experienced, he was a man who was successful. Quite simply, Joseph lived with the hand of God on his life. He was a success. And the text tells us <clears throat> what the secret to his success was. And that ought to be important for all of us because we all want to be successful, don't we, right? We want to be successful. If you're playing a sport, we're watching the Olympics right now, we're seeing elite athletes trying to medal. They are trying to get on that podium. They want to be successful in their sports career. If you're in academics, you want to be successful in school. If you have a job, you want to be successful in your career. If you have a family, you want to be successful in your family. What's the secret to success? Well, chapter 39 attributes Joseph's success to one thing. That one thing is not Joseph's charisma. It is not Joseph's good looks. It's not Joseph's uh, ind industrious work ethic. It's not his ingenious uh, creativity. It's not his brilliant mind. None of those things are attributed with Joseph's success. There's one thing and one thing only that the author of Genesis attributes Joseph's success to, and that is this statement, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him four different times in Genesis 39. It says that the Lord was with Joseph. And folks, if you wanna know a definition of success, that's a pretty good one right there. That despite all the things you might go through in your life, if the Lord is with you, that's a flourishing life, amen? If you have the absence of every good thing in your life, but you have the presence of God in your life, you have the presence of the most important thing, that is success. And so success equals the presence of God in my life. That is what success looks like. And four times this chapter says that the Lord was with Joseph. Look at verse two. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. You wanna know what it looks like to be a successful man? It looks like the Lord being with you. Look in verse three, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master. Look down at verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and he granted him favor with the prison warden. Look down at verse 23, the warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with Joseph and the Lord made everything that he did successful. If the Lord is with you, you can be successful no matter what, amen? I want you to see three moments in Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 39 that shows you how the presence of God in your life makes a difference. How God being with you and knowing God is with you can make you successful even in the most difficult and adverse circumstances that come your way. Here's the first way that we see that in this chapter. In verses one through six, we see simply this truth that when God is with us, we can be successful in trials in trials. And we see Joseph facing a, a, major, a major trial in verses one through six. We're reminded of the trials in verse one. It says, now Joseph had been taken to Egypt and an Egyptian named Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and the captain of the guards bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him there. Let's just stop right, th right there. Verse one is just to remind you of what's happened in chapter 37. It's a reminder of the trials that Joseph has undergone. God had given Joseph amazing dreams about his future, dreams that he would have prominence, that he would rule and reign. And yet in, in, uh, in contra expectation to those dreams, Joseph gets dealt a very bad hand here. His brothers betray him. They sell him to Ishmaelite traders. And then he is bought by a man named 
Potiphar down in Egypt. Now, if you're a Hebrew young man, the last place you want to go is Egypt. And if you're going to go there, the last thing you would want to go as is a slave. And if you're going to be a slave, the last person that you would want to work for is Potiphar. We're told that Potiphar was an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guards. Now, the guards, you can translate literally as he was captain of the executioners. In other words, Potiphar's job working for Pharaoh was to be in charge of the executioners that would be responsible for carrying out the death sentence that Pharaoh would have for people in his kingdom. In fact, uh, you see this happen in chapter 40, the very next chapter. You remember the story, we'll look at it next week, of uh, Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker who are sent down to prison. They're waiting to be executed. Well, it was Potiphar who was in charge of this a uh, uh, company of executioners that would carry out the death penalty. So the last person that you want to be enslaved to is Potiphar. But here you have Joseph, betrayed, sold, down in Egypt, now purchased by a man named Potiphar. And this shows us that success and, and trials are not mutually exclusive terms, right? For most of us, Success and trials, those two words don't belong in the same sentence. But biblically, success does not mean the absence of hardship. Here we see in Joseph's life, plenty of hardship in verse one. And yet the text says that the Lord made him successful. Look at what happens in verse two. The Lord was with Joseph in that trial in that slavery, in Egypt, in this moment where he's down in the dumps, the Lord was with him there and he became a successful man serving in the household of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made everything he did successful, Joseph found favor with his master. Now, verses four through six are gonna show you evidences of that favor and evidences of that success. Look what happens in verse four. Joseph became the personal attendant to Potiphar. So think, think about this. Potiphar has lots of slaves. He's seen how they live. He's seen how they work. But there's something different about this particular slave. This particular Hebrew man is different than all the others, so much so that he catches Potiphar's attention and Potiphar gives him an important and prestigious job. Potiphar is an important man in Egypt and he gives Joseph kind of a right-hand man kind of role in his household. He becomes kind of his personal assistant. And Potiphar also put him in charge of his household and placed all that he owned under his authority. And from the time that he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. And the Lord's blessing was on all that he owned in his house and in his fields. And he left all that he owned under Joseph's authority and didn't concern himself with anything except for the meal that was right in front of him. That's an amazing turn of events in Joseph's life. He goes from being betrayed, sold into slavery, purchased by a captain of executioners to being noticed by that captain and elevated to a position of responsibility and leadership where the Lord blesses everything that he touches. And, and uh, Potiphar, notices this about him. Potiphar pa- pa- notices this about him. He notices that everything that Joseph touches turns to gold. Everything that Joseph's involved in seems to go really, really well. And so Potiphar begins to hand him more and more responsibility. And every time Potiphar gives Joseph an additional level of responsibility, Joseph handles that diligently and wisely and well, and it flourishes. And so Potiphar hands him even more, right? Joseph is the exemplification of a man who's faithful with little, who God entrusts to be faithful with much in the worst possible circumstance, this trial that he's going through in his life. And so Potiphar eventually turns the keys to everything over to Joseph. He is like Potiphar's golden goose. Everything Joseph is involved with goes well. He's industrious, he's wise, he's conscientious, he's hardworking, he's ethical, he's a man of integrity, he's a man of responsibility. And so eventually he gets responsibility for everything in Potiphar's household. And Potiphar notices that every time he hands more responsibility to Joseph, Joseph brings him greater prosperity and blessing. Verse five tells us that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. 
So it's clear that Joseph is the recipient of God's blessing, but Joseph is also the agent of God's blessing to Potiphar. Now, this is exactly what Genesis 12 says would happen. Remember in Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abraham. One of the promises that was that he would bless Abraham and Abraham's descendants and that through them, they would bring blessing to the nations. That's literally being fulfilled here in the life of Joseph as the Lord blesses him but then he becomes an agent of blessing to the nations and this Egyptian receives blessing because the Lord is with Joseph and because Joseph is with the Egyptians, the Egyptians are blessed. That's amazing to me that, that uh, how Joseph responds in this trial because life has thrown him lemons. He has been dealt a bad hand. Let's just be real honest. Joseph's life in this moment sucks. That's a Hebrew word, it sucketh, okay? Can we just be real? Like this is the last thing that you ever wanna have happen to you. Be sold into slavery, work for Potiphar. How could he have responded? Well, he could have responded with complaining, faithlessness, rejection of God, uh, griping, moaning, This is how the Israelites often respond when you see them later on in their history in the wilderness wanderings. You remember things go south for Israel and instead of calling together a worship service and saying, hey, let's pray and ask God to meet our needs. What do the the Israelites do? They're always moaning and growing. They're mumbling and complaining and and they're they're questioning God and his goodness, right? So they run out of water and they're they're complaining to God or they run out of food and they say even, it would be better to go back to Egypt and live in slavery than to serve this God who, who leaves us out to starve to death. And the truth is sometimes when life deals us a bad hand, we can respond that way as well with faithlessness or we begin to question God or we just begin to be depressed and down in the dumps and we moan and we groan and we gripe and complain. That is not how Joseph responded at all. Joseph responds when he's been mistreated and dealt a bad hand by rising to the occasion and working in such a way for Potiphar as to bring glory to God. I was reminded this week of Romans chapter 12, which talks about the the will of God in our lives. And and there's three words that describe the will of God in Romans 12. It says it's good, it's perfect, and it's acceptable. And you know, when when life is going uh, well for us, when our life is easy, when life circumstances are turning out favorably for us, it's very easy for us to say, oh, God's will is good. God's will is perfect. God's will is acceptable. But what about when God's will involves trials of the nature of verse one, can you still say, I'm going through something difficult, I'm going through a trial, but God's will for my life in this moment, in this trial is still good, is still perfect and still is acceptable. That was Joseph's mentality facing this trial down in Egypt was to trust that God was doing something through this trial. And so he responds with diligence, He seeks to glorify the Lord exactly where he was and he's a successful man as a result. Now, what's the secret to that? Well, the text tells us it's because the Lord was with him. How can you respond to trials that way? The only way is if you rely on the presence of the Lord in that moment, right? When you're dealt a bad hand or you're handed some lemons in your life, when your life sucketh, how are you gonna make it? The only way to make it so the Lord is with you, a recognition and a reliance on the Lord's presence with you in that moment. And so when God is with you, you can succeed in trials. 